preacher and the children cried. Yonder comes the preacher and the children cried. Yonder comes the preacher and the children cried. Chickens in the pot with the toenails are flying. Yes, sir. Hot corn, cold corn, bring a lot of damage. Hot corn, cold corn, bring a lot of damage. Hot corn, cold corn, bring a lot of damage. Bear the wheel off the bed, see you in the morning. Yes, sir. Truman Public Library. My name is Katerina. I'm the youth librarian here. So nice to see so many folks and so many familiar faces. Please join me in welcoming Aaron Jonah Lewis. He's here tonight to play some banjo for us and also to promote his new album, Mozart of the Banjo. Downstairs, downstairs, out in the kitchen. See them boys just reeling in the kitchen. Yes, sir. Hey, hot corn, cold corn, bring along with them, John. Hot corn, cold corn, bring along with them, John. Hot corn, cold corn, bring along with them, John. Hey, they were on the bed, see you in the morning. Yes, sir. Interesting story. I'll try in the interest of time. I'm going to be telling a lot of stories tonight, but I'm trying to really play a lot of music too. <laughs> um, this is a song about a group called the House of David, and I know I'm supposed to be talking into the mic. Sorry, you can you can just turn the mic off. I don't think I need it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, don't need it. Can, can you actually turn it off? Yeah. Thanks. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I thought so. Uh, normally you're supposed to be quiet in a library, but now I can be loud. The House of David was an interesting group. Back in the 1920s, um, long before the uh, flower power and hippie movement of the 60s, people were doing uh, strange things. They were 
going back to the land, they were growing their hair long, they were experimenting with communal living, uh, all kinds of different lifestyles. Uh, it was a real period of experimentation and um, there's a group that had, had its headquarters in Benton Harbor, Michigan, on the west coast of Michigan, called the House of David. They were founded in 1909, and by the 1920s, they were a national phenomenon. Uh, they were distinctive because they grew their hair long, and men had long beards, they all dressed very modestly, which was not the usual uh, way of dressing in the, in the time. Um, and they, uh, they believed in purity of the, of the body and of the mind, so they, uh, they didn't drink and they didn't smoke, and they didn't have sex, uh, so they're not around anymore. <laughs> it's a terrible story. <laughs> but um, one thing they did do with all that creative energy was to play a lot of music, and this is how they tried to get converts. They would go all over the country and play on street corners. And so this is what that song refers to. It's mostly a nonsense song, but it refers to the House of David playing music on the street corner. And Ain't It Grand, this is a fiddle and Arthur Smith of Dixon County, Tennessee his version of the House of David Blues. <laughs> Most people probably are thinking, 
bluegrass, right? <laughs> So that's how I got my start with the banjo too. I, I saw bluegrass, you know, I grew up here in Detroit. I didn't know anything about banjos as a kid. As I traveled, I became exposed to this stuff and I saw a banjo player one day when I was, you know, 18 or 19, I just couldn't stop staring. It was the most glorious sound I'd ever heard. So uh, I'm gonna do a song for you that I learned from a singer named Jim Smoke. Uh, he was from North Carolina, and he moved to Louisiana. He's one of the early bluegrass players uh, back in the 19, late 40s, early 50s. And he was the first bluegrasser in Louisiana. So he called his album Bayou Bluegrass. And uh, he did take some of the Cajun influence into his music. But this is a song that I, I can only guess was pretty widespread. I don't think that these motifs that are, you're going to hear in this song are unique to this particular version, but this is his version of a very corny country song. Uh, corny country humor is the thing that we might not have as much of around here, but uh, basically it, it's like the dumbest possible jokes ever, <laughs> and yet they're still funny. <laughs> this one is a song about the great big billy goat.
bit of bluegrass banjo for you. I might, I might come back to that later on, but uh, I want to go back to a slightly older style that in some ways is, is the oldest style of banjo playing. It's called claw hammer style. It's also called frailing or, or rapping or knocking. It's a different technique. Instead of picking up with your fingers, you go down and hit the string with the back of your finger. So I'm going to play another song that I got from Fiddler and Arthur Smith. This is a very common tune. Uh, many versions of it are out there. And uh, this version I haven't heard anyone else do. A song about a gal named Cindy. table along with the CDs and the email list. I'll try and remember to say more about it later, but I'm going to play a tune that uh, you, might, you might hear at a square dance, kind of a regular old square dance fiddle tune. <laughs> before breakfast. <laughs> Thank you. 
next week to the square dance. That's going to be great. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about the banjo. Um, the banjo, the American banjo, I should say, because there are banjos all over the world. Uh, many different cultures have instruments that are like banjos. I've played instruments like that in India, in Turkey, um, I know in China, and uh, basically it's like a drum with strings on it. And uh, the American banjo has its roots in Western Africa, uh, came to this country with the slave trade. There were people who were living in West Africa and they were kidnapped and put on ships and forced into labor. And when they got here, they made banjos with what little free time they had. It's kind of incredible to think about uh, if you were to uh, just get taken out of your home in the middle of the night, for example, um, and then taken to another planet where <coughs> nothing was familiar to you. Um, I've, always, I've often wondered that happened to me, of course it would be really tough, especially if you get separated from your family and from everyone you know and maybe no one speaks your language anymore. But somehow you'd find a way to, to survive. And what would you attempt to recreate in the new world if you had any free time at all with uh, unfamiliar resources around you? For these people, the banjo was the thing that, that they would recreate. Um, of course, they weren't able to carry them with them from home, from Africa. Um, so they had to find ways to make them, find time and find resources. That means that the banjo must have been very important. And uh, I think that the instrument has a lot of power because of that. Um, so in its early days, the banjo was associated with the plantation and with slavery because it was the slaves who built them and the slaves who played them. But as with all kinds of culture, it was appropriated by the dominant, the dominant culture um, who saw that and said, well, that's pretty neat, and then started making banjos and playing banjos themselves. Um, this led to the banjo becoming the most popular instrument in the country uh, by the end of the 19th century. But even much earlier than that, there was this form of entertainment called minstrel shows that's uh, pretty important to know about. It's been uh, difficult for people to talk about for a long time because it's really a very, was a very racist form of entertainment. But it's important to know about because it formed the foundation for all of our current entertainment. And uh, everything from Broadway to, to vaudeville to Hollywood, um, Everything that is on the radio and on TV now can be traced back to minstrel shows. Um, minstrel shows consisted of a small group of typically white men, although later on African Americans would also partake in this as a way of making a living in entertainment. Um, but it was typically white men painting their faces black and putting on these shows where they would portray caricatures of African Americans, these uh, slave stereotypes as well as freed slave stereotypes. Um, and that's hard to talk about, it's hard to own up to and to say, yeah, that really happened. Uh, the thing that's important to also not forget is that that's not all that it was. It was also a form of bringing people together and uh, commenting on current events. Um, it was a way of sharing music and dance and song and comedy and having a really good time. So. It's complicated, it's more complicated than saying they were bad or they were good. They were bad and good. Um, and it's up to us to, uh, to take it apart and, and not pretend that it didn't happen. So the banjo was a big part of the minstrel shows because of their association with the, um, with the plantation and with African American culture, which was being mocked. Um, but at a certain point, around the uh, middle of, well, sorry, the later 19th century, after the Civil War, um, the people who played banjo in the minstrel shows started to become influenced by Spanish guitar players. So in the minstrel shows, they played kind of like a claw hammer style, like uh, this down picking style. <laughs> started 
practicing what was called guitar style as opposed to banjo style banjo. Guitar style banjo, which was up picking, kind of like bluegrass. <laughs> the same notes but it sounds a little different and this opened up possibilities for a lot of different uh, expressions a lot of different styles that could be played there was potential for much more complicated music and so composers started writing more complicated music and they were exploring the limitations of this banjo which it certainly has limitations um, but this ended up becoming the most popular music in in the English speaking world and I'll get to England a little bit later, but in America it was definitely the most popular style of music, this, this music that we now call classic fingerstyle banjo, which I'm going to demonstrate for you. This was the first time in history that the banjo was played on a performance stage without the use of blackface makeup. So the people playing this music saw themselves as elevating the instrument and uh, taking it away from the blackface, the comedy, the songs and the skits and the dancing and the outrageous costumes. And it was, uh, yeah, it was the first time in history that it could stand on its own. And it was kind of uh, beloved by uh, everyone. It was uh, highbrow music, it was considered morally uplifting and therefore acceptable for middle class people to enjoy as well as for ladies to enjoy, which of course yeah. ladies were very restricted in what they were allowed to do in those days. Um, and it was also considered entertainment, which meant that the working classes could enjoy it as well. Um, I'm going to play a piece for you now by an American composer named Park Hunter, and this one is called Fun on the Wabash. traveled to England after the banjo has already made quite popular over there. The banjo first made its appearance in England in the 1830s with uh, Virginia minstrels. They were sort of the original minstrel group who kind of
promoted themselves as only doing minstrel shows, uh, because for a while minstrel shows were part of vaudeville and they were part of other shows, there was a smaller part of it. But it, it grew and grew in popularity to where these guys could just do minstrel shows all day long. They went to England to play for the royal court and they thought they would stay for maybe a week or two and they were kept there for months because they were so popular. Um, it even got to the point where King Edward VII was learning to play the banjo, taking banjo lessons. That's a secret the royal family doesn't want you to know about. Um, but, you know, as the royals do, so everyone else will take notice. And the banjo became popular throughout the whole country. Uh, rich and poor, young and old, men and women. And, uh, you know, uh, one surprising fact I learned when I was in England, uh, a friend of mine told me that there were roughly an equal number of banjos manufactured in England as in the US. So um, this style of banjo playing is, uh, you know, it was like rock and roll. It was even bigger than rock and roll because rock and roll was sort of restricted to youth culture. This was for everyone. This was young and old, rich and poor, like I said. And uh, if you can imagine 50 years from now, rock and roll being completely forgotten with the exception of a few dozen people here and there <laughs> getting together in their little pockets of seclusion to celebrate that old music. That's kind of what this is like. Um, there are literally hundreds of people in the entire world playing this music, uh, and fewer, fewer than five performing professionally, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm one of them. Um, and uh, a lot of them are in England, the, the people who play this music. Most, most of them are amateurs, most of them are hobbyists. Um, but England has really kind of kept a lot of the tradition alive. Uh, in case you're wondering, most of the rest of them are in upstate New York because that's where some of the major players uh, of the past generation lived and they kind of had students and gathered people around them. And other than that, they're scattered all over the place. Um, I know that here in Michigan, there are a few of us, like literally three. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I want to share another piece with you, and then I'll tell you some more about my album. Um, but here's a piece by Joe Morley uh, that was never published until recently. Uh, I'll tell you more about Joe Morley after I play this one. This is called Walk Round. Thank you. 
Thank you. So that's a piece by Joe Morley, and I call Joe Morley the Mozart of the banjo. Uh, he had a few interesting things in common with Mozart. For one thing, he was a child prodigy. For another thing, he was very prolific and kind of represents the, uh, the typical music of his genre. You know, he's, Mozart is kind of chosen to represent classical music. If you're going to remember one composer, you'll remember Mozart. It's kind of like that with Joe Morley as well. Um, he was very prolific. He also died poor and was buried in an unmarked grave, just like Mozart. But unlike Mozart, he's not remembered so well. So I'm trying to uh, promote his music a little bit. Um, it's really interesting, the, the, the British banjo tradition, um, how it's connected, it's sort of a missing link in, in banjo history. And uh, the banjo is such a fascinating vehicle for exploring history, because it's, it's always been there. Uh, at least in this country, since the, since before the beginning of this country, uh, people have been playing the banjo, so it's it's always been there. Um, uh, now this this music we call it classic figure style banjo. People often confuse that with classical music. It has a lot in common with classical music, but did what I just played sound like classical music? Kind of. No, not really. It's a little bit. Not really. But yeah, it's sort of like it's not really like folk music either. It's kind of its own thing. It was sort of parlor music of the turn of the century. Um, however, to make it more complicated, um, classical music was often played in this style, on the banjo. Uh, why is that? People who were writing classical music a hundred years ago, they were still alive. People like Rachmaninoff and Debussy, um, they, that wasn't old music. That was fresh. That was new. You know, Just like you would want to have you heard the new single that everyone's talking about uh, that's on the radio now? Well, they didn't have radio then, or records. They had sheet music, and people would learn to read and, and share these melodies and get very excited about them. So um, I thought I would play uh, a classical piece for you by uh, a well-loved composer named Chopin. This one is uh, a piano piece called uh, Prelude... It's opus number 28, prelude 20, in C minor. I arranged it myself in the original key. So uh, it's, may, it's maybe a little bit on the sad side, but I promise to play a happy tune afterwards. <laughs> I think I'm, we're going to do two sets, have a little intermission, right? So um, I'm going to just play one more, and then we'll have a, a short break. Okay, uh, during the break, uh, I will sell CDs to you, and I will um, encourage you to sign up on my email list. 
which is uh, how I'll keep in touch and uh, let you know about my upcoming gigs. I've got uh, my album is not yet officially released, but I have pre-release copies, souvenir copies available here. They're a limited edition, and um, when they're gone, they're gone. The official album will be out in about a month, and there will be a, an album release show at Cliff Bell's January 5th, as well as at the Ark January 16th. So um, between now and then, you just have to like do Thanksgiving and Christmas. So. <laughs> Um, so this music was really at the height of its popularity from around 1890s to 1920s when jazz kind of took over uh, the radio and the recording technology kind of changed everything, changed the way people related to music, changed the way people listened to music and played music. Um, so people weren't playing music themselves anymore by the 1920s. It was less common for people to just play for their own amusement and more common that they would buy a record player buy a record, pay someone else to play music for them, um, and go out to clubs, which didn't used to happen so much except for the big symphony halls. Uh, this time period overlaps, the pre-jazz period overlaps with ragtime. Ragtime, which is the glorious music made by free African Americans as well as by white folks. Um, and were, was the banjo a part of this process? Very much so. In fact, the banjo music uh, influenced the ragtime music. I always thought it was the other way around uh, until I learned better. Um, I thought that this banjo stuff was the banjo version of ragtime, but it's actually ragtime is sort of the piano version and orchestra version of this stuff. Uh, but of course there was overlap and, and uh, crossing of you know signals and people uh, sharing different ideas back and forth. Um, so there were a lot of uh, banjo versions of ragtime pieces. I'm going to play one of those for you now. This one's called The Smiler by Percy Wenrich, also known as the Joplin Kid from Joplin, Missouri. So here's The Smiler Rag. <laughs>
someone asked me if there's what's the tuning there's many tunings so I'm switching tunings now a large part of the Appalachian region. This was the most popular song and everyone was playing it constantly. It's called Cumberland Gap. Take a little man, lay down, boys, lay 
singing and, and instruments playing, but uh, this is a tune I love. Um, it's Bob Will's crooked version of a tune called Pike's Peak, and he called it Prosperity Special. Oh wait, you know what else? I could, I could play some other Bob Will stuff. Oh, I'll play this anyway. <laughs>
I'll play a tune that I, this is a, a new one for me, I learned this recently. It was written by a Texas fiddler who played with Bob Wills named Johnny Gimble. And it's, uh, it's called uh, Gardenia Waltz. with my five-piece band, the Love Struck Balladeers. They all live in New York City, so we don't get together too much. This is going to be our first time playing in Detroit. Um, last year we played in Flint, but we're also playing in Toledo this time. November 12th, if you can make it, we've got a new album that we're putting out. And um, I learned this song because of those guys. And uh, by the time I learned it, they didn't want to play it anymore. <laughs> so I'm playing it in my solo show. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, I just know this is like... Oh, my consolation is in the stardust. 
of a song. Beside a garden wall when stars are bright, you are in my arms. The nightingale tells his fairy tale of paradise where roses bloom. Though I dream in vain. Facilitated. He was a very charismatic person and kind of problematic as a politician. I'm not going to get into that part of it. The music part is great. So um, this is a song that he may have written himself. I couldn't find songwriter credits, so it's possible that he wrote it. And I find it just delightful. Congratulate me, step right up, shake my hand. My baby told me that she loves me Is that a break, boys, or is that a break? Am I awake, dear, or am I dreaming? Congratulate me, things turned out as I planned My baby told me that she loves me You'll find me dancing on a rainbow above Congratulate me, I'm in Classic banjo music now. 
this is the, I guess a lot of the stuff I play is stuff you wouldn't hear in a lot of other places. That's maybe why I play it. I'm drawn to the less commonly played material. There's so many treasures of the past to dig up and share. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to get back into the, uh, I'll play something from the album for you. Um, this is a exciting piece by Joe Morley called Banjo Land. And uh, not to tell you what to think or anything, but what I picture is, um, you know, the, the composer is envisioning uh, a utopian society. Well, no, maybe not even that, but just a, a better world, right? Full of banjos. <laughs> Everyone's got a banjo, everyone's playing the banjo, there's banjo music everywhere. So, hence, Banjo Land. <laughs> was written in the 1940s or 50s by a composer named Frank Laws, who was uh, known as Fifthless Frank. Uh, another, you know, someone during the break was asking me about the fifth string. Is it old? Is it an old thing to have a fifth string or is that newer? And the oldest known banjos and the instruments that inspired the banjos, the instruments that are still found in Western Africa, of which there are dozens, uh, none of them exactly look like a banjo, but a lot of them are very similar. Um, they all have this, uh, this shorter fifth string, this shorter kind of re-entrant string. Uh, it's a curious thing, but that's one of the things that makes it a banjo. Now, later on in the 1920s, with the advent of jazz, the fifth string was removed, and so were born plectrum banjos and tenor banjos with shorter necks, and played with flat picks and steel strings. Prior to that, the instruments always had gut strings, and then after World War II, I believe, they started using nylon strings because they didn't really have that back in the 19th century. Um, what was I talking about? Fifth was Frank. Uh, yeah, he played um, classic banjo. He played fingerstyle banjo music and wrote banjo music that was played by five-string banjo players, but he didn't have a fifth string on his banjo. <laughs> and so um, he, you know, almost none of his music calls for playing it. So uh, this piece 
is going to have no need of the fifth string. Um, and it's called progressions. last night uh, but um, this is I'll play this every night this is the best uh, one of my favorites another piece, a piece by another British composer named Emil Grimshaw um, this is probably his finest work well one of his finest I know some other ones are really good too this one's called the Banshee
like to play another Joe Morley piece for you now. This one is called Egyptian Princess. <laughs> sign up on my mailing list and take your time doing it. Write it really big so I can read it. <laughs> Grab a flyer for the square dance. It's in a week. It's, I tell people, uh, you know, it's a potluck, but you don't have to bring food. It's ten bucks, but you don't have to pay. And it's a dance, but you don't have to dance. <laughs> All you have to do is show up and have a good time. But the violin and guitar? The, the I mean, band uh, will include uh, fiddle, guitar, and bass, and probably some other people joining in as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the CD release will be in January at the Ark and at Cliff Bells, so you'll hear about it if you're on my mailing list. not just this event, but all the events that happen here. What a wonderful thing to happen, and I hope y'all are tuned in to, to come to whatever the next event is going to be here. Um, Hamtramck is really just full of great events all the time. Uh, I don't know how anyone can keep up. 
but uh, I try. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close with a a request. Devil went to Georgia. Sorry. Devil went to Georgia. Oh yeah. Yes. So uh, yeah, Charlie Daniels was a, a, a better fiddler than you know. He had to actually play worse than he was able in order to make that recording. <laughs> um, but no, uh, someone requested Orange Blossom Special. So this is probably the most popular fiddle tune of all time. Uh, it's a good old train song, uh, written by Irvin T. Rouse, who uh, didn't do a lot else with his life, <laughs> but he wrote a great song. <laughs> And 
lose these New York blues.